I didn't think there was much more to learn about cadence, but actually, I was wrong. Your cadence, or your pedaling rate, has long been the topic of debate in cycling. Some riders spin fast, others slow. And when I was a pro, I'd say cadence wasn't something I thought about all too much. Recently, we've seen some changes in pro cycling. Riders are actually eating food in the form of eating more carbs whilst they're riding. Cranks are getting shorter and tires are getting wider. So, is cadence part of this revolution, if you excuse the pun? What's the latest advice and has the science changed? In this video, I've done some investigating and the results surprised me. Okay, so before we dive into this, a little bit of background on cadence. So in cycling, cadence is a metric which measures the amount of times your pedal completes one full revolution per minute. And that's otherwise known as RPM. Now, there's long been a debate about what anyone's optimal cadence is, but when I was racing, it was kind of considered that if you're able to spin a higher gear, have a higher cadence, it was valuable. To the point where I actually remember a really talented teammate of mine on a development team when I was younger. He was strong as an ox, put down massive power, but he loved to grind his gears really slowly. And I distinctly remember everyone at the time thinking he was crazy for pushing such a low cadence in a race. To the point where my team manager at the time actively tried to kind of train him away from this habit. So I think the reason for this was because at the time, many of the sport's best pros were riding with quite a high cadence. I mean, look at Chris Froome. He was attacking in the Tour de France with a cadence of upwards of 100 RPM. For context, my own cadence is pretty average, as most people's is around 80 to 85 RPM. So is it a waste of time to try and emulate riders like Froome and try and ride with a higher cadence? There has been plenty of research just trying to answer just that. Okay, so this study by Hans Hess and Uberschka in 2024 looked at 14 professional track cyclists, nine sprinters and five endurance, performing efforts at different intensity levels up to a maximal sprint to look at what cadence was optimal for the riders at each intensity by measuring power, heart rate, VO2 and blood lactate at each cadence. The conclusion? Researchers found that as intensity increases, your body naturally prefers faster pedaling. So, at a lower effort, optimal cadence was around the 66 RPM mark, whilst at VO2 max, it rose to 84 RPM. During sprints, it rose to a super fast 134 revs per minute. The theory based on this research is that as intensity rises, your body starts using more fast twitch fibers, hence cadence naturally rises. This is similar to what you see on Zwift, the virtual riding platform. It has a ton of riders of varying abilities, racing, riding, and completing workouts. I managed to get my hands on average rider data on the platform. And it's really interesting because across the board, cadence rises in more intense categories of effort. So average cadence for those free riding, 74 RPM. In a group ride, it's 76. In a TT, 78. A race, it rises further to 79. And with a group workout, it's the highest average, 81 revolutions per minute. I say a definite trend there of cadences rising in more intense efforts. However, this study, also in 2024 by Thomas Wackwitz et al. in Australia, investigating the influence of cadence on fatigue during maximal sprint cycling, concluded that fatigue per pedal stroke doesn't change too much across different cadences. Researchers measured how much power dropped per pedal stroke in 15 second sprints in 11 elite sprinters. Each rider did a test to find their optimal cadence at max power, then performed 15 second sprints at this cadence and 15% above and below it. Due to results of the study, researchers thought that because how much power being dropped each pedal stroke was about the same, whether riders pedaled faster or slower than their optimal cadence, it could actually be better to reduce cadence in sprints in order to limit power loss over the course of the entire effort. Okay, let's just hold on for a second and rewind 
for a moment because I think it's important to remember Cadence's relationship with power on the bike. So your power on the bike is equal to your torque multiplied by your cadence. Or in other words, your power or your rate of work done is equal to the force applied to the pedals multiplied by the rotational velocity of those pedals. So if your torque or your cadence increases whilst the other remains stable, then your power also increases. But say your torque remains the same, but your cadence drops, then your power drops. How does cadence change over the course of a pro race? Here right now, you can see my own power data from the 2017 World Road Race Championships. I was actually in the early breakaway for most of the first 240 kilometers, with my effort staying fairly constant throughout on a lapped set course. On the first ascent of the main three and a half kilometer climb, I averaged 86 RPM with an average power of 378 watts. Four laps later, 89 RPM, average power of 431 watts. Another 91 RPM, average power 479 watts. The next lap, my final one in the break, 85 RPM, 372 watt average. Cadence rising as the intensity wrapped up, but also decreasing ever so slightly on that final lap before I ran out of gas, which is something I've always anecdotally noted. It's harder to maintain higher cadences when you're tired, but does that matter? This study by Peter Leo at Innsbruck University concluded that it potentially does. Previous studies, like this one, have actually highlighted how it's torque, not cadence, that separates different cyclists. But Leo's study, consisting of 17 elite male cyclists, all members of UCI Pro Teams 2, tested riders before and after they had achieved a set amount of accumulated work, 2,500 kilojoules, basically like a hard ride. The test included short sprints and longer effort, 15 seconds, 3 minutes, and 12 minute efforts done in controlled conditions. The results showed that there was a strong link between cadence and fatigue, with the fatigue from that accumulated work causing lower cadences and therefore reduced performance. Essentially, when tired, it was that inability to maintain the same cadences as when fresh that caused the drop in power, not a drop in torque. Their findings were consistent with this study too, which also found power drops are more closely related to cadence than force at the pedals. Their recommendation, training at higher cadences could help improve your fatigue resistance, which is a topic that Sai delved into on the channel recently, if it rings a bell. Now, in that video, Sai spoke to Peter Leo, who is a sports scientist and high performance coach at Jayco Alula, and whose research I've mentioned here in this video. So I caught up with him to get his own take on what his research conclusions mean and why he was so interested in investigating cadence from a performance standpoint. So it's not a new thing at all, as, as fatigue resistance and all. It's maybe a hot topic, but it's not new at all. But we, we are able now with all the context and, and information to just frame it better. Because if you look, even if you take a five minute effort and you look at, let's, let's say you can do 400 watts over five, or, over five minutes. But when you look at the cadence you're operating, you, you, it could be that you really need to be exact within two to three RPMs and exact that cadence. And as soon as you are out of that range, you struggle to actually produce the power. And what I mean by expanding the spectrum is that you can express that 400 watts within a, a range of 15, 20 RPM. And this is where you, you became a lot more versatile. It's really interesting. So basically just being able to like have that change in pace of your legs just allows you to stick with the pace a, a Correct. way, basically. So this is what we found in this paper that um, pretty much up to one minute, I would say the, the, the force and the torque is the, the really limiting factor. So it's, you can literally say it's muscle related. The fatigue is muscular related. As soon as you go beyond the one minute, one and a half minute, close to two minute target, it becomes more systemic limited. So it's, it's more about the cardiovascular system. And what happens here is that the athlete uh, non-deliberately choose to not maximize for the maximum torque. They actually want to optimize the torque demand and they fluctuate with the cadence variations to make sure that they are in balance with their torque demand. Because just we know that if we not balance the torque demand, 
we blow muscularly. And that's what you want to avoid when you want to go for a sustained effort that is longer than two minutes. You got to balance that. And you see what's happened at the end of a test or when you completely blow up, you drop with the cadence and you can no longer maintain uh, the, the, the cadence, but also when cadence drops, your power drops. So that's kind of, in short, the summary we found. Going back to my own data though, so this is a really rough look at my power file from Umloop Het Newsblad. You can see in the first hour of racing, I averaged 94 RPM and 377 watts. Then towards the latter stages, and I remember actually, this wasn't a great day for me in terms of feeling or form. I averaged 82 RPM and 311 watts for an hour towards the end. Now, this was a race at the start of the year when I wasn't as race fit as I would be after gaining a lot of race days and fitness. And I find it interesting to look back now, now I've kind of been through this research and see that difference in cadence. Of course, it's super rough comparison, but it is food for thought nonetheless. Motor pacing, like this, is a training tool which many pros use to prepare for races. And I myself really valued it when I was racing too. But to be honest, I could never quite put my finger on why it was so beneficial. Because essentially, you're doing an effort at the same power you would solo, but you're riding much, much faster. You're having to move your body around on the bike to stay in the draft. And then you have to adapt your pace quite a lot. And looking at some of this research, I do think that is the reason why it's so important and can be so key because you really are having to adapt your cadence a lot more than you would if you were completing an effort solo. You spin more, you're forced to ride at a higher cadence to stay in that draft as you would in a race. And I think this for me is why it makes it so different to getting out on your own in completing an effort. There is also research out there that points to high cadence training translating to improvements in leg speed. This study concluded that high cadence specific training could shift a rider's preferred cadence. The study put 16 cyclists through six weeks of training across 18 interval sessions. One group trained at 20% above their freely selected cadence, assessed from previous testing, and the others trained at 20% below their freely selected cadence. After the six weeks, all riders repeated a 15 minute time trial. The high cadence training did improve their freely chosen cadence, improving their gross efficiency too, whilst the low cadence group had no change in cadence, but did achieve greater performance gains. But what would Peter Leo advise to add into training to improve your ability to pedal both fast and slow? You take a set of 10 times 30 30s and in the on phase, like the 30 seconds on, in the first set, you could prescribe the on phase with a very high cadence and a low torque, which means they're almost spinning, but they can never really produce the force. And in the in the low phase, you just go big gear and slow rolling, just slow rolling big gear in the recovery. And even that decoupling is tough because you gotta be shifting the whole time and it's it's actually not so easy. Then in the second set, you could swap it. So you go high torque, low cadence on the on phase and uh, high cadence, um, low torque on the off phase. And in the third one, you would just do the athlete whatever they want. The interesting thing is, if they go to the, back to their preferred cadence, what, what I found is with, with my athlete is that they actually are able to express a lot more than they would usually do. So there seems like a bit of a reserve component in there which you just try to unlock and then your optimum cadence occurs where you actually are able to express your peak power output like your spring power your highest spring power so if you want to go for a sprint your optimum cadence is right at the top of 120 rpm if you think about that parabolic shape everything left to this curve is more force dominant whereas everything right to the curve is more frequency dominant so you can actually walk away as a coach and, and, and test your athletes and see where they actually end up. Are they more on the force side? Are they more on the cadence side? And you have a very good decision um, making in, in terms of what training intervention uh, you plan with these athletes. You, you can actually individualize your approach. We definitely saw changes that riders could just operate at a higher cadence while they're fatigued. 
So that's that's the thing. But also, I found it interesting when I looked at the cadences where the race was pretty easy. They deliberately choose to go lower, so they use the bigger gear and just avoid cadence revolutions. They sit around 70 RPM, just use a big gear and try to avoid um, much revolutions. However, when they go more in the tempo, pay, tempo phase, then they, they decide to change and then they actually lower the gear and bring up the cadence. Up to this point where they almost go maximal and they're really high on the RPMs. Because what we know from the lap, as soon as you did the climb with cadence, you're pretty close to uh, all out or exhaustion. So it really depends on on who you're working with. But I think uh, adding some profiling uh, to that and getting a better understanding of their patterns and what is limiting them is a first step. And then ideally you do like a, a, a talk cadence assessment with with a, like a sprint protocol at different gears where you can plot your your optimum cadence and your your shape and then you actually can see where they limit it. I think that that would be more like a a more strategic approach. And again, it's something that I think if it's if it's used already, I think there's just a time and a place for doing things. Uh, you don't want to do that in race week because the closer you get to race, the more they should operate on on their selective cadence to just make sure their locomotion and everything is is efficient. But if you have a, a bigger training block and you have not not discovered that yet, why not be able to implement some variation? It's not always all about the power outputs, not always about the, the watts you put out, but rather than what corresponding cadence and what were the conditions you put that out. So sometimes if you if power output stresses you too much, which some athletes don't prefer in training, then just go via RP and give give rather than a, a power target, give them a gear or a cadence target for an interval. I think the key takeaway for me is that cadence is definitely something you should pay attention to more than potentially I'd have thought of in the past, particularly if you're someone who struggles to put down the power in different scenarios, different situations, potentially in a group setting, then being able to, to mix your leg speed up, to implement certain segments into your ride where you do, you do pedal at a rate which is different to what you're used to, can be very beneficial. It's that cherry on the top of the cake sort of stuff. It's not going to kind of make you a world beater, but at the same time, it could potentially take your performances up a notch. And let's face it, it's, it's something that you can do in the riding you're already completing. It's not something that has to be done in addition. It's spending a bit of time on your usual ride and just mixing things up, being aware of it. At the same time, I don't think that cadence is something that you should really pay note to in the midst of a kind of race effort or when you're on a big goal. I think in that respect, you are just gonna naturally select the leg speed that's right for you in that situation. But it's been really interesting to delve into this topic more and see how those at the top of the sport are really paying notes to cadence and how it's potentially having a big impact on their preparation for some of the sport's biggest races. And let me know in the comment section down below if cadence is something that you really pay attention to, if it's something that you put into your riding on the bike and your training. Be really interested to hear your thoughts and especially if it's worked for you or not. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you found it useful. See you in the next one.